Well, the big news this past week was the revelation that some American soldiers out of prison in Baghdad had been torturing Iraqi prisoners. And this created all kinds of a hubbub. Of course, everybody who commented on it, whether he was a war hawk or a dove, tisked, tisked and said this is terrible. And, of course, this does not reflect the way that American soldiers do business as a general rule and that this is an aberration, an exception, and we should not get the wrong idea about it. Well, of course, this usually comes from people who have never been in wartime, people who have never seen what happens to innocent young men when they find themselves under wartime conditions. There are really two reasons that such atrocities exist. One is simply the ugliness and the horrible conditions that exist in wartime, conditions that civilians can never really understand because they haven't been there. And these conditions of being in a situation where disease and dysentery and lice and maggots and all sorts of things become your constant companions and where you see situations in which people have to kill or be killed, it's hard for civilians to realize how this affects the minds of soldiers and changes them from what they were as those innocent young men in Denver or Tulsa or Boston or someplace else. There have been books written about this. Eugene B. Sledge wrote about his experiences as a Marine in World War II in a book entitled With the Old Breed at Pele Liu and Okinawa. And I'd like to just read a little from that. Actually, it was Paul Fusell who wrote a book called Wartime, which really went into all the things that actually happen in wartime to the GIs. And he, writing about Sledge's book, said, If innocent when he joined the Marines, Sledge was not at all stupid, and he knew what he was getting into was going to be tough in training, because in training the emphasis on the K-bar knife and kicking the Japs effectively in the groin made all that very clear to him. But the remaining scales fell from his eyes when he saw men simply hosed down by machine gun fire on the beach at Pele Liu. I felt sickened to the depths of my soul. I asked God, why, why, why? I turned my face away and wished that I were imagining it all. I had tasted the bitterest essence of war, the sight of helpless comrades being slaughtered, and it filled me with disgust. Before the battle was over, with casualties worse even than at Tarawa, Sledge perceived what all combat troops finally perceived. Quote, we were expendable. It was difficult to accept. We come from a nation and a culture that values life in the individual. To find oneself in a situation where your life seems of little value is the ultimate in loneliness. It is a humbling experience. He knew now that horror and fear were his destiny, unless a severe wound or death or more unlikely a Japanese surrender should reprieve him. And his understanding of the world he was in was filled out by watching Marines levering out Japanese gold teeth with their K-bar knives, sometimes from living mouths. And it is, uh, that's the end of the quotation from Paul Fusell's book, Wartime. And it is in this kind of situation that inevitably men are changed. They are no longer the people they were before. They're living in a completely different world from us, a world of kill or be killed. Fusell goes on to talk about Sledge's experience and quotes him and says, it was there that he saw, quote, the most repulsive thing I ever saw an American do in the war, end of quote. He saw a young Marine officer select a Japanese corpse, and if I may interject, I'm not going to say what it was that happened. It's just too gruesome to quote on the air. To go on with Fusell's statement, though, if much of this would be incomprehensible to a home front nourished on athletic and heroic models of combat, it wasn't understandable even to Marines a few hundred yards back. Speaking of the incredible cruelty that was commonplace when decent men are reduced to a brutish existence in their fight for survival amid the violent death, terror, tension, fatigue, and filth that was the infantry man's war, Sledge notes that, quote, our code of conduct toward the enemy differed drastically from that prevailing back at division headquarters, end quote. Unequivocal is Sledge's assertion, quote, we lived in an environment totally incomprehensible, not just to civilians at a great distance, but even to men who were not on the front lines. Well, this is what happens in wartime, and we should not expect it to be different. In a different part of the book, Fusell quotes, the Marines loved to use the few Japs who came forward to surrender as amusing rifle targets just as they felt intense satisfaction watching them twist and writhe when set afire by the napalm of the flamethrower. Japanese skulls were not the only desirable trophies. Treasured also were Japanese gold teeth knocked out sometimes from the mouths of the still living. The treatment of Japanese corpses as if they were animal became so flagrant as early as September 1942 that the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet ordered that, quote, no part of the enemy's body may be used as a souvenir, unquote. Now, in circumstances like that, people are simply going to act in ways that are different than we can comprehend at home. So the first reason that atrocities such as what happened in the Iraqi prison can take place is simply because of the ugliness and the horrible conditions that persist in wartime, no matter how many John Wayne movies you've seen or Sil Sylvester Stallone or Chuck Norris movies that make wartime seem to be a glorious, clean, antiseptic experience. The second reason atrocities occur, torture, mutilation, 
is the feeling of power that comes from having coercive control over other human beings. Some people can find themselves in that position of power and not abuse it. Others quickly succumb to the temptation to display their superior position over other human beings. And the easiest way to display that superiority is by degrading the victim through torture. In an article about these events of the past week of the revelations, attorney Gary Myers is quoted. He's a lawyer for Sergeant Chip Frederick, one of the men accused of committing these tortures. The attorney said, the elixir of power, the elixir of believing that you're helping the CIA, for God's sake, when you're from a small town in Virginia, that's intoxicating. And the defendant himself went on to say in that article, which is on the radio links page of my website, harrybrown.org, the defendant himself said that he, would, he reveled in the idea that he was helping to break these prisoners so that they would reveal information to the interrogators. And he felt like he was doing a great thing. But it's wartime again creates this feeling of God, of doing things that are going to be for the greater good. In World War II, Winston Churchill willingly sacrificed the lives of thousands thousands of English civilians by allowing the Germans to bomb English towns even though the English had broken the German code and knew that the, the airplanes were coming and they could have intercepted them. But if they intercepted these planes and stopped them from bombing the English towns, the Germans would catch on to the fact that their codes had been broken and would change the codes. Churchill said, and I quote, war is an evil thing. In order to live, we must play God, end of quote. And that's exactly what happens with politicians, not just men on the front lines, but with politicians who suddenly start moving people around like pawns on a chessboard. The funny thing about Winston Churchill complaining about being in this awful position where he had to play God is that he was a prime cause of their being in that position in the first place. In World War I, Winston Churchill was the first Lord of the Admiralty, which is equivalent to the Secretary of the Navy in the United States. Churchill instituted a blockade of German ports. He said the object of the blockade was to, quote, starve the whole population, men, women, and children, old and young, wounded and sound, into submission, end of quote. And that blockade was one of several reasons that Germans felt so humiliated and so devastated at the end of World War I that 14 years later they gladly accepted Adolf Hitler as the thug who had the ability to right the wrongs that had been done to the German people. So Winston Churchill saw it all come back, and now he was in a position where he had a justification for playing God. I received an email from Eric out in cyberspace who says, I've noticed that many who said they were thankful for the atomic bomb ending World War II, that this saved their lives, never ever mentioned that it was the U.S. government that held a gun on them to force them to fight in the Pacific in the first place. It seems these people cannot ever contemplate that they were drafted into slavery and their danger was brought on them by their own government. I find that anyone who went through that also cannot face the truth of how we got into World War II. Well, one of the big myths of World War II, a myth that persists to this day, is that if it hadn't been for the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, hundreds of thousands of Americans would have died in an invasion of Japan. Well, this is untrue on several counts. There was practically no one in the United States government at the higher reaches of the military who believed there was going to be an invasion of Japan. First of all, the Russians were about to enter the war, and they figured that this was going to be enough to end the war uh, very, very quickly. Secondly, Japan was blockaded. It was short of food. Japan has no natural resources at all. They even import rice, which is the number one dish in Japan. And the entire Japanese islands were blockaded by the American Navy. Japan's own Navy was completely destroyed at that point, and the Japanese people were beginning to starve, and they couldn't hold out much longer. So you would think that they were going to surrender at any moment. Well, wait just a minute. In fact, they had already tried to surrender. They had sent peace feelers through Switzerland, through the Soviet Union, through several other places where they were trying to bring about an end to the war, and they said that the only condition attendant to their surrender would be that the emperor remain on the throne. But Franklin Roosevelt coined the expression unconditional surrender, which meant there would be no conditions attached to the surrender. Harry Truman, once Roosevelt died and Truman took over, Harry Truman re-emphasized unconditional surrender. Truman went to Potsdam in Germany to the conference there. He conferred with the Russians and with the, the uh, British, and their various military commanders were there also. The Germans were already out of the war. That's why the conference took place in Potsdam, Germany. By this time, they knew that the atom bomb worked. The test had taken place in New Mexico, and now the question was what to do with it. Everybody there agreed that there was no reason to drop the bomb. But then when the conference ended, Truman and his Secretary of State, James Burns, got on a ship 
and headed back to the United States. By the time they got to the United States, Truman was convinced that they should drop the bomb anyway. So it was dropped on Hiroshima, even though the Japanese were asking to surrender. And at that point, the emperor said, get this thing over with. It doesn't matter whether I stay on the throne or what. Just end this before any more people die. But by the time they could do that, another bomb had been dropped on Nagasaki. Truman, in his usual display of complete honesty and candor, got on the radio on a nationwide broadcast after the Hiroshima bomb was dropped and said, we have dropped a bomb of unparalleled proportions on military targets in Hiroshima. Hiroshima was not a military target. It was a civilian target. If it had been a military target, it wouldn't still be standing. The American Air Force had been bombing uh, Japan for a year, firebombing Tokyo, firebombing all the military installations. The only reason Hiroshima was chosen as a target was because it was not destroyed like all the other Japanese cities were. And it was the only one still standing because it had no military significance. Anyway, the Japanese said, all right, we surrender unconditionally, and the Americans accepted it, and guess what? They left Hirohito on the throne. The war could have been over six months before that. There could have been no atomic bomb. There could have been at least 50,000 American soldiers who died in the Pacific that could have lived. People have wondered, historians have wondered, what caused Truman to change his mind and drop the bomb when it was unnecessary. And the only explanation I found that makes any sense whatsoever is that Secretary of State James Burns thought that by, dis by dropping the bomb and displaying it to the world, this awesome power that the United States had, that it would intimidate the Russians and they would be more pliable at the end of the war because they were already foreseeing problems developing between the United States and the Soviet Union. This is a common assumption. How many times have you heard war hawks say, only strength can prevent war. Only the use and willingness to use force can make other people back down and prevent war. And it never works. They killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And still, the Soviet mo Union moved into Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Poland, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Albania, and all these countries. And we had a Cold War for 50 years almost. The, the dropping of the bomb accomplished absolutely nothing. And it isn't just American politicians that do these things. It's being done by any politician who has the power. The problem has been that it is the American politicians who have had the overwhelming power over the last 60 years or so. And so it is the American politicians that are the greatest danger to the world, to peace and security and liberty. It comes now from America. At one time it came from the British, and another time it came from the Germans, and another time it came from the Russians, and another time it came from the Chinese, and another time it came from the French. But for the last almost 100 years now, it has been America that has been calling the shots since World War I. And that's why we have to be preoccupied with the dishonesty of American politicians, with the power hungriness of American politicians, and with their ability to wage war. One last email before we go to the phones. Uh, Jerry out in cyberspace says, I read last week that Bush said the government can't prevent another attack. So when the next attack happens, he can say, see, I said another attack couldn't be stopped. <laughs> I suppose that's true. He also says, what do you think about starting up the draft again? Well, of course, I'm violently opposed, violently, violently opposed to the draft. It is pure slavery. It is the worst kind of slavery. But I would say there's a 50-50 chance of it happening. Let's go now to the phones and talk with Dave in Pismo Beach, California. Good evening, Dave. Hi, Harry. How are you? I'm fine. What's yeah, up? Tell you are Revan tonight. I mean, uh, <laughs> I heard you a whole lot in the past, but uh, what you have said tonight has been uh, incredible. And I hope it's taken a heart by uh, people who do hear you, because uh, you can tell you've given a lot, a lot of fun. And uh, it's uh, what you just talked about, the whole Japanese thing was incredible to me. I had no idea that they were ready to surrender. And the whole idea of a uh, unconditional surrender that was uh, demanded is totally preposterous. But more important, I think, right now, currently, is the idea of what our, our kids, our children are doing across, uh, across the ocean. The pointlessness of the whole thing is incredible to me. Uh, Dave, are you on a cell phone? Yeah, we're having trouble hearing you, so I guess okay. you're going to have to be brief simply so that we can get the point from you. Okay, Harry, I guess uh, real quick, uh, to I, I hope you have the ability to get published what you just read, not just the Japanese part, but about the war right now in Iraq and the idea of what power can do to young people and their situation that they're involved with right now and how they can be not the people we think ourselves to be, the civilized people we are, but... Uh, ruthless barbarians in a war that uh, power has given them, made them uh, this way. Oh, that's a good point. You know, I, it, you know, I think what I'll do is put this in an article, and it'll probably be on my website this week. Uh, what is that site, Harry? Oh, harrybrown.org. <laughs> Get published what you just read, and oh, let it, more people hear this. I don't know how many people are listening to this today, but what you what you were talking about before the whole Japanese thing, sure. just something that people should know about and should 
here. She should read. So get it done. All right. Uh, you'll be surprised. Thanks, Harry. Thank That's you, Dave. I appreciate your call. All right. Let's go now to Johnson City, Tennessee, and talk with Bob. Good evening, Bob. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Brown. I'm a first-time caller. Just wanted to say I, I was deeply moved by your essay about war a minute ago. Like you said, there are no winners. And, uh, you know, where does it stop? Where does the United States stop being the fleet force for the world and all of our guys getting killed? The answer to the question now seems to be pay off this general, that general. Our soldiers aren't getting paid off. The families of the people that are dying aren't getting paid off. And we need to know something to keep the United States from being the police force of the world. My father and my stepfather were both in the military. And uh, I consider myself as patriotic as anybody. But the fact of the matter is we're, uh, there's, there's no winners here. There's no, there's no options for the future. So what do we do to change things for the future? Well, the first step, of course, is to just keep speaking out wherever you can do so without great harm to yourself. And you'd be surprised how receptive a lot of people are. Not everybody, of course, but a lot of people have been harboring thoughts and doubts and skepticism about this. But when they hear everybody else accepting what the government says at face value, uh, it's not easy to speak out. But when you speak out, you suddenly find that if you're talking to a group of four people at a party, that one or two of those people are uh, let you know that you're saying what they've been thinking and didn't want to say out loud for fear of sounding too stupid. And I'm not saying that you should intrude your political views where they're inappropriate to bring up, and I'm not saying that you should threaten your job by speaking out to people at work, but wherever it can be done, you will be amazed at how many people agree with you. And we're not going to change this overnight, and it's foolish to think that there's some kind of silver bullet that can change it overnight. But if we keep chipping away at this and events keep moving along in the direction they are, more and more people are going to realize this. We're stuck this time choosing between Kerry and Bush, both of whom are very decidedly pro-war. But sooner or later, we're going to get somebody who isn't, I hope. And when we do, maybe we can really turn this all around. And let's now hear from someone of the fair sex, as opposed to those of us in the unfair sex. Hey, Dolly, you must mean me. <laughs> <laughs> That's Ruth in Tacoma, I believe, right? Yes, correct. Yes, you, we used to hear you all the time up here. Oh, and I have to sneak in and listen to you on Saturdays. Um, Are you getting it on the radio or over the Internet? It's on radio. It's broadcast in the KLAY, 1180 AM dial. K. L-A-Y, got it. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. What's up tonight? Well, uh, you are encouraging us to speak up when we, we suspect or want to know if something is right or not. Uh, and I'm sure you know how difficult that is, not just among colleagues and family members, but can you imagine if you're in uniform and in theater. Oh, like sure. Our, like our young people are now, and they're being held responsible for their actions, which may have come as orders from above, certainly by license from those above. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yes, one of the complaints of uh, Sergeant Chip Frederick, who was interviewed by... CBS's uh, 60 Minutes 2, Sergeant Frederick said that there were no clear guidelines given them as to how to treat prisoners in Iraq, and so they didn't believe that they were doing anything wrong. Well, I seem to remember over 30 years ago a young man going before the House of Representatives and saying the guidelines kept changing and testified to what he witnessed himself, included himself, and he's being chastised, marginalized, and lied about to this day. So you can imagine what responsibility you're asking young people to take on. Of course, and the thing that really galls me about all this is how blithely, how cavalierly people talk about this. So yes, of course there is collateral damage. Yes, of course there is a price to pay and so forth. And they're not paying any price at all, and they're not in these conditions, and they have no idea what it's like to be in wartime. They have well, no, no idea what these people over there are going through in Iraq, and they talk about our brave soldiers. Some of them are scared witless, which is not to say that there's anything wrong with them. They ought to be scared in a situation like that. But, of course, we hear that they are brave and they're doing this and they're heroic and so forth. And this guy, Tillman, the athlete, I mean, he's being eulogized as though he were George Washington at the Valley Forge. And, of course, he may have just been like you or me over there. He may have been urinating in his pants. He was so scared. But he's going to be glorified because if we glorify these people, then it makes war itself glorified. Well, almost 20 years before secretaries of defense and state admitted Vietnam was an error, John Kerry was saying not that it was an error, but that to please factor in the cost to those who return home, not just the dead, but the walking wounded in mind and in spirit, and that this is what you are asking them to do, please consider it, before you make policy. Take control and declare a war if you want to give them a war. But whatever it is we were doing over there was so unclear, it changed daily from troop to troop. Sure, and even the policy changed. I mean, the American government helped assassinate the DM family, who were our great, brave allies there, well, supposedly in South Vietnam. Well, we put them there for the purpose of having an invitation to go give them technical assistance in what some... 53,000 people later. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you're right about that, but to go back to what you said before about the, the wounded who come home, the wounded in, in spirit as well as in body. Well, that's and, the cost of national defense, if yes, that's and it's what not, they're doing. And it's not quantifiable, and so as a result, it just gets ignored. But the people who come back will never be the same. And they will you, never treat human life in the same way that they did before they went to war. And the people who speak up will always be punished. Well, Are uh, they? 
they are they are where war is at stake. It was uh, true. It's been true in every war that I've investigated. Those of the last hundred years that people who spoke out against the war were pro-German, pro-Japanese, uh, pro-Nazi, pro this, pro that. American. Yes, they're, they are. They're trying to preserve the American ideal of peace and liberty, which Washington and Jefferson bequeathed to us. And for doing that, they are said to be anti-American. All right, let's continue talking to people on the telephone. We'll go to Baltimore, Maryland, and talk with Andy. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, Harry. I would like to register a complaint. All right. You're on an hour later. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's pretty tough on the East Coast, man. I know. It's now 1 o'clock there. Yeah, it, it, it is. But, but still, as usual, it is worth every moment of lost sleep to uh, listen to Harry Brown. Well, uh, thank you. I, I, when you listen on the phone for a while, your initial question has a tendency to, to sprout roots, I suppose. I think a lot of callers have, have that problem. I found it interesting that you were talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and atrocious, I mean, horrible atrocities, almost in the same breath of talking about six or seven soldiers from Maryland uh, leaving uh, Iraqi prisoners, maybe a little worse for the wear, but still alive. Mm -hmm. It is a measure of what true atrocities are, I, I, I believe. Uh, I guess in a non-war sense, what I was looking for your comment on was, I was taken this week... That, that perhaps three years ago, three and a half years ago, uh, the, the, uh, the, the President of the United States, uh, Mr. Bush, could not wait, could have to be held back from rushing to put his hand on a Bible to, to, uh, to swear to be the best president ever, to take, to take an oath before God. Yet uh, finally this week when he testified before the 9-11 Commission, he uh, negotiated a, a, a settlement where he wouldn't have to swear an oath to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what your thoughts on that were. Well, of course, I don't know what's going on through his mind, but I do know that what he has done by what you just said, it leaves the obvious impression among people that he's afraid to swear an oath for fear that he will then be found to be guilty of perjury, whereas if he simply has a conversation with the members of the commission and something turns out to be untrue, untrue or misinformed or whatever, there would be no possible consequences. And whether that's really his reason, we don't know, but it seems if it isn't his reason, he's pretty stupid to uh, refuse to take an oath because that's the impression that he's going to leave with people, just as the impression that Condoleezza Rice left by not wanting to testify under oath was the fear that she would be found later guilty of perjury. And incidentally, as long as we're on that subject, I have heard over and over and over again in the discussions about first Condoleezza Rice and then George Bush and Dick Cheney testifying that they were trying to preserve the separation of branches of government. Uh, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. It, it's absolutely absurd. Uh, administration officials testify constantly before Congress. The chairman of the FCC or the head of the Homeland Security Department or the head of the Housing and Urban Development, you know, so forth and so on. They go forward, yeah. they talk about their budgets. This happens all the time. So why suddenly does there have to be a strict separation between the branches of government? Well, and, and they weren't so worried uh, six years ago uh, about separation between between the branches of the government when they when they were investigating Clinton for cheating on his wife, excuse me, for lying about cheating on his wife. Sure, uh, and, of, and of course at that time Clinton had to appear, uh, and that was because the Re Republicans wanted it then. Now the Republicans don't want it. The Democrats didn't want it then. Now the Democrats do want it. it well, it, and the special prosecutor uh, law the law has, has has expired as well. Yeah, the, you know, uh, years and years ago I heard came across the information that uh, Washington and some of the other founding fathers had warned against the development of political parties, that this was an evil to be avoided. And I couldn't understand that because it seemed to me that political parties served a purpose in setting ideological frameworks and uh, things of this sort and taking care of the technical business of running for office and so on. But today I really, really do understand that warning because what has happened is we have fallen into these rigid positions where anything a Republican does, no matter how bad, is all right with a Republican. And anything a Democrat does, no matter how bad, is all right with a Democrat. And the whole question of whether something is right or wrong depends on whether it's a Republican or a Democrat doing it. And the whole idea of examining something with an open mind is lost. It is like, uh, as I've said before on this show, it is like my school, right or wrong. My school has a terrible football team this year, but it's my alumni, and I'm going to cheer for them, and I, the last thing I want to see is that our hated opponents win the big game this year because I'll never be able to live it down, and that's exactly what it is. The Republicans, the conservatives, they will not admit that Bush has done anything wrong because to do so would imply that maybe Al Gore should have been elected after all. And, of course, when Clinton was in office, the Democrats wouldn't agree to any idea that Clinton had done anything that was materially significantly wrong, because that would imply that maybe George Bush Sr. or Bob Dole should have been elected in place of Clinton. And this is just wiped out discussion. You watch these talk shows on television, and you know where everybody's coming from. You know what they're going to say, and you never hear an original thought, because all they're doing is mouthing the slogans of their own parties. It's, it's amazing that people watch, isn't it? I mean, it, yes, it is, and including me. It's amazing that I watch. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know I diverted you from talking to war. And, and the talking to war, Harry, was frankly was quite brilliant. Uh, I, I, I was in Dallas last week for an investment conference, and I, and I, I 
I get pinned in the corner by a, a conservative from Little Rock and a conservative from Dallas. And, and I suppose I'm going to leave you on a, a slightly a, a, a lighter note. And, and, and both were convinced that uh, George Bush was going to win in a landslide. And, and, and both were very polite to me when I said, oh, you mean he's going to get another Supreme Court justice? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I suppose they didn't think 63 was a landslide. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Harry, you are, you are brilliant as always. And, and I'm sorry to divert you from, 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 from your really scintillating talk on, on, on government and war, but it's just the way that my phone call got captured. I'm, I'm sorry. but You don't have to apologize, Andy. I appreciate the kind words. And we're here to talk about anything that you want to talk about. So I'm glad you called, and we look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. All right. We are getting a rash of calls from Johnson City, Tennessee. And one of them is from Dorian. And so let's see what Dorian has on the docket tonight. Good morning, Harry. Good morning. Well, I talked about getting sidetracked. I had... Ten things to say, and I just want to respond to your caller. <laughs> By the way, I want to thank you. Uh, I am going to go for a libertarian again. Uh, we had the conversation several weeks ago, and uh, it's amazing. Kerry is sounding more like Bush, and I haven't heard the word Patriot Act come out of his mouth. So you know what? Uh, damn both parties, the damn Republicans or a public crap. So I'll just go back to my libertarian voting and let them do what they got to do. I admire you for that, and I say that advisedly that I admire you because it is so easy to fall in the trap of being so disgusted by one politician that you want to go out and vote for the other one just to teach this guy that you don't like a lesson. And it's so easy right now when Bush is creating so many problems for us and for the world to think, well, anybody is going to be better, Everybody and so I'll vote Bush. for Kerry. And yet you know darn well that two years from now you're going to be feeling the same way about Kerry if he's in office. So I admire your your steel this there to be able to overcome that well i need a little encouragement from you uh by the way a quick thing before i get to the point now let me try to talk quickly uh i always thought that it was okay for people of the uh, uh of the legislative branch to go before the uh to have the executive come before them since it was the uh legislative branch that was the boss of the executive and anytime they wanted to fire him they could through a uh through a uh what do you call it uh, impeachment impeachment yeah and he was responsible to them, just being a chief executive officer in, in, in the uh, overall sense well that's a good way to put it yeah uh anyway uh, i wrote you a long article under my pen name called uh, Staying the Course. You may have gotten it just a little while ago. Uh, it's kind of interesting because that's what you're talking about tonight. But uh, uh, one other uh, point, uh, you know, all the atrocities they're talking about, they've, these atrocities have been discussed for months now. But I think it's a cover and it's a smokescreen because the Iraqis have been complaining and we've known about it. In Fallujah, the, the real problem started in Fallujah when I think it was 15 or 17 people going to a wedding were killed by the uh, U.S. Army in cars. Yes. You remember that event about a year and a half ago? Uh, a year ago. You're yeah. thinking of the one in Afghanistan. No, it was, uh, well, that was another one where they were firing their guns in the air. Oh, uh, well, there was the one in Afghanistan where a wedding party was wiped out by wiped out. American but, bombers. But this was 17 people uh, going to celebrate something that was shot. And that's when the problem started. There have been civilian deaths up the kazoo. And now that, we, you know, atrocities are atrocities. It's showing just what our soldiers are capable of, like any other soldiers. Uh, but we're forgetting how many innocent civilians, you know, called collateral damage, are, are being just slaughtered. Slaughtered. And uh, that's what I wrote about in there. Uh, but, you know, so now we're focusing on, you know, somebody being mentally tortured. Meanwhile, uh, you know, people are being, families are being wiped out. Yes. And, yeah, and, uh, and we're, not, we're not focusing on that. Yes, and, I, and I, th I guess it's because the bombing of innocent civilians, the firing of missiles into hotels and things of this sort, right. is a, a command decision more, whereas this seems to focus on the misdeeds of individuals. And we don't uh, criticize the commanders, and we especially don't criticize the commander-in-chief. But you're making a very good point that this is obscuring uh, the, the atrocities that have been going on daily for the last mm -hmm. several years. Yeah. Very good point, Dorian. All right, well, Harry, have a, well, I was going to read you something funny, but I think we're coming up against the break, aren't yeah, we? Yes, we are. You can hang on if you like. This is Harry Brown. We'll be right back. And Dorian is still on the line with us. Dorian, you said at the beginning of the phone call that you had sent an article under your pen name, and I don't believe I got that article. Do you want to say your pen name over the air? Uh, it's not a secret, but I don't usually mix it. But uh, let me uh, – well, it's Joel. How's that? Joel. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, I'll I look live, for I live two lives. I live my business life and my real life, Harry. <laughs> oh, you have a real life, too? That's you too, lucky fellow. Too much of a real life. It keeps me from doing what I need to do, and that's my writing. Uh, if you didn't get it, I just sent it to the uh, – to, uh, I forgot what it is, but it's at harrybrown.org, and I forgot what the at was, what came before at, and I can resend it to you. Okay. What is it? To, what's the email? Well, just harrybrown at harrybrown.org will do it. Okay. I may not have it, and I'll just do that in a few just minutes. Just be sure to put an E on the end of Brown. Yes, I, I know that. Let me just, uh, this is not funny, but let me end you with something out of uh, the AP wire service from yes. about a week ago. On the same day that the U.S. dropped two 500 laser, uh, 200, two 500-pound laser-guided bombs and a 1,000-pound uh, bomb sent in an AC-130 gunship, all right? Kimmel turned around, General Kimmel, and said, even though it may not look like it, there is still a determined aspiration on the part of the coalition to maintain a ceasefire. <laughs> oh, he is right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
uh, and, and they just say this, and they, you know, you're not supposed to pick up on it, are you? No, well. that's that's what I like about the Daily Show with John Stewart. It seems to be the only place on television that anybody ever calls attention to any of these absurdities. <laughs> you know, people make these these empty statements, this stupid rhetoric, these uh, inconsistencies, these hypocritical statements that are hypocritical to something just said in the last sentence, and nobody calls them on it. You wait for one of these talking heads to to say, well, well wait a minute, what about this or that? And the only place that you can never see anybody call these people on it is on a comedy show. Uh-huh. It's strange. Anyway, for those who don't know, I've mentioned it often enough, but uh, for those who don't know, the, com- uh, the Daily Show with Jon Stewart is on Comedy Central. And offhand, I don't remember what time it is, but it's uh, on three or four different times a day. The same show runs several times. But it's, it's well worth seeing the opening ten minutes or so where they talk about uh, the latest political news of one sort or another. I may try it. I've never listened. Okay. Well, have, a, have a wonderful morning, Harry. Thank you very much, Dorian. I appreciate the call. During the break, I went to the World Net Daily site because our friend Dan in San Diego had said that he had a letter published there, and I went to look at it. And while I was there, I saw another letter in the letter section in which somebody quotes John Stuart Mill as having said, War is an ugly thing, but not the ugliest of things. The decayed and degraded state of moral and patriotic feeling which thinks nothing worth a war is worse. A man who has nothing which he cares more about than he does about his personal safety is a miserable creature who has no chance at being free, unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. End of quote. Oh, I just wonder how many wars John Stuart Mill fought in. I have never read a biographical book on John Stuart Mill, but I really suspect that he never fought in war for even a single day. It is so easy to talk about how important it is that we display our ability to stand up and fight and to do all of these things and that this is more important than personal safety not personal safety of you or me but personal safety of these unnamed people that we're going to send over there to get caught up in crossfire to get perhaps hit by friendly fire to suffer disease to see the worst kind of conditions to become so degraded in their mental feelings that they were are willing to commit atrocities against the enemy things that they would never do back here at home and These are other people that are going to go out and do this. And what we will do is we will do our part by staying here and talking about the wonderful glories of standing up for the nation, standing up for right and the American way and democracy in Iraq and all of these other things without having to lift a finger and without having to put ourselves in any kind of personal danger whatsoever. There are, of course, plenty of people that do that. And they're not necessarily Republicans. Democrats have done it often enough. It was the Democrats who wanted to go to war in the Second World War, and there were a lot of good Republicans that resisted that. In the First World War, it was the Democrats who wanted peace, and Woodrow Wilson actually wanted to go to war, but when he got to the Democratic Convention in 1916, he found that a speaker had already said that Wilson kept us out of war, and the crowd went wild. And so Wilson reluctantly had to run as the peace candidate, even though he was champing at the bit to get America into the war. And it just depends on the time and place and the circumstances. There are no principles that apply from one situation to another. It's just whose ox is being gored. And our conversation tonight has been pretty much dominated by war. I got an interesting email from Matt in Salt Lake City who says, There is one example of large military strength preventing a war. North Korea has the power to fight back with nuclear weapons, so they have prevented a war that we may have otherwise started. (laughs) Very, very good point, Matt. I can't argue with that at all. As we have discussed on this show before, our government has a history in the post-World War II era of attacking only countries that can't fight back. Countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, Panama, Grenada, and so forth. And we have studiously avoided attacking countries like the Soviet Union, which was the evil of empire, pardon me, the evil empire, as you may recall, and our sworn enemy, and the Red China and so on, the really uh, tough birds. We don't attack. We call them our partners in the peace process, as Ronald Reagan put it. Uh, Clint writes, says, when will the war racket be available? I pre-ordered it on BICOM. But then they finally canceled it. I encourage you to tell people to pre-order the book through Bicom or Amazon.com. I am going to resubmit my order now. I'll have to say I haven't checked Amazon or Bicom to see if they are taking orders for the book, but I guess you could do that. The book is scheduled to be out in January, and it's called The War Racket. And they probably know about it already because the publisher, Thomas Nelson Company, has been out peddling the book and getting advance orders for it. Kayleen in Massachusetts says, to quote William Sherman, war is hell, and you are right on track saying that we do not belong in any war except if American soil is under attack, and that being limited to strictly protecting our land, never getting involved in any foreign wars, no matter what our warmongering politicians try to brainwash us into thinking. Uh, Good point, Kayleen. And, of course, there are war hawks who will say, well, our country was attacked. Uh, The World Trade Center was attacked. Yes, but there are no foreign troops on our soil trying to take over the city of New York or any place else. The people who were responsible for that attack, who maybe facilitated it in some way, should be tracked down. And, if possible, they should be caught and brought to trial and brought to justice. 
but I cannot guarantee that if that were tried, it would even succeed. But, of course, killing 10,000 people has no guarantee of success, and it almost certainly has a guarantee of non-success, meaning that killing 10,000 civilians in Iraq or 10,000 civilians in Afghanistan simply means that more people around the world are going to be willing to help the terrorists the next time they want to attack the United States. All right, let's go back to the phones and talk with Bill in Jackson, Tennessee. Good evening, Bill. Oh, Mr. Brown. Yes. Yes, sir. It's a question I like, I like your opinion on. And the fifth, I had a couple of no longer with me. They fought in World War II. They would never talk to me about it, you know, whatever they went through, I don't know. So what's your opinion of a, I know a president is a commander in chief, but a man that hasn't been in a war, sending people to war, for instance, uh, President Bush, he joined the National Guard back then. He had goal was he to fight. Well, a uh, person like President Kennedy, he was almost killed in a war, and he lost a brother, he never found his body, so he knew what war was about. You understand what I'm trying to say? Sure. Sure, and uh, George Bush Sr. fought in the Second World War, too. And Ronald Reagan, Re Ronald Reagan uh, made war pictures during the Second World War. That's close enough, isn't it? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, on my website, harrybrown.org, there is a, a draft of a constitutional amendment called the Peace Amendment, which is designed to try to keep Americans out of war as much as possible. And one of the uh, clauses in that amendment is that the commander-in-chief can take military action only if Congress declares war, and when Congress votes on declaring war, only those congressmen who are of draft age or have children of draft age or grandchildren of draft age are eligible to vote on whether the United States will go to war. In other words, no one should be allowed to make that kind of a decision who won't have a personal stake and won't feel the cost of war. The cost of war, in other words, will not be put on somebody else's shoulders. And I understand what you're saying, and I, I agree with you, but... It is strange that people like George Bush Sr. and John F. Kennedy and others who did fight in World War II or fought in World War I were quite willing to go to war again, and I don't really understand that. I guess it's some kind of perverse psychology at work. Well, I went through it, so why shouldn't others have to go through it? I don't know. All I know is that when somebody gets into that Oval Office and has all that power at his disposal, it's pretty hard to resist the temptation to use some of it. Yes, well, might I ask you something else, a second question, quickly? Yeah, maybe you'll get a better answer to the second question. <laughs> well, I don't think, now, I have a few friends that have, you know, children in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that don't know anybody over there, and the ones that don't have any relatives over there or whatever, they just say stay over there, fight, fight, fight. But the few I know that have a brother or a son or somebody over there, they got a totally different view on what's happening over there. Understandably. I mean, they got something to lose. Sure, understandably so. Uh, yes, and of course we, we get all these glowing stories about the soldiers who have written to George Bush and told them uh, to keep keep firm that uh, we're winning the hearts and minds of the Iraqis and we're doing good work here and I'm proud to be over here and I'm glad to be here and so forth and so on. And, of course, we don't know what that's all about. In fact, there was a bit of a scandal about, well, when was it, six or eight months ago, where it turned out that letters were being written by the camp commander somewhere in Iraq and they were signing the names of the different soldiers to it and sending these letters to uh, editor, uh, newspaper editors in their hometowns and so forth. Um, but I'm sure there are some people over there who think that they're the, they doing the right thing and they are glad to be there and enjoying the fighting maybe even. And there are some parents who are probably proud and delighted that their children are over there fighting. But on the whole, what you said, I'm sure, is the overwhelming situation, and that is that those who know that their children may not come back from Iraq are just devastated by this and living from day to day, uh, scared to death that they're suddenly going to be notified that something has happened to their loved ones. And it's a terrible situation, and it, it's so unnecessary. There's a point I've made before on this show, but I haven't made tonight. When people ask you, what would you do? Supposing Iraq really were a threat, what would you do about it? We know now that it was not a threat and even should have been skeptical about it from the get-go because if it was a threat, there should have been hard evidence of that and the president should have seen that hard evidence and he should have presented it to the American people, but he didn't, so we had every reason to be skeptical before the fact. But suppose Iraq really were a threat. What would you have done about it? The answer does not have to be a complete plan to show how this could have been taken care of short of war. The answer is, look, they've got over $2 trillion at their disposal. If I had $2 trillion a year at my disposal, I'm sure I could hire the best minds in the world to come up with solutions that do not involve killing a whole bunch of people and that would defuse this situation and make sure that we are safe. But they don't use that $2 trillion for that purpose. They use that $2 trillion to build stupid bridges in Alaska that go no place. They use it for all kinds of boondoggles that never produce the results that are promised for them. They use it to go in and change countries like Haiti, putting Aristide in power in the late 90s, and then go back about five years later and kick Aristide out of office the way they did with Noriega in Panama and the DMs in Vietnam and the Trujillos and Dominican Republic and on and on and on and on. They waste the $2 trillion and then they tell us that they need more of our money and that they have to go to war and they have to do all of these other things. Government is not the answer to anything.
happening. And even if there is a terrific threat somewhere in the world, government is not going to solve the problem because governments are not constituted in a way where people's own lives are on the line, where people's own careers are on the line, where a mistake can have bad consequences the way it can when you're in business or when you're working for somebody else. And as a result, government doesn't work, and it is never going to produce the results that are promised for it. And you didn't expect to get this kind of a tirade from me, Bill, but there you are. Oh, well, Mr. Brown, it was nice talking to you, sir. Well, I appreciate your call. Thanks so much, Bill. Check in from time to time. Yes, sir. I sure will. All right. Uh, Chris in Ann Arbor sent an email. He says, have you ever taken a look at John Kerry's website? His agenda is about as public puzzling as George Bush's agenda. For example, in regards to Iraq, he's happy we got rid of Saddam, but feels that instead of the U.S. determining Iraq's government, we should let the U.N. do it. And I say, why not let the people of Iraq do it themselves? But I guess people making their own decisions doesn't fit in with a plan. All this speeches on the site sound like George Bush's soundbite. So he's talking about Kerry's site sounds like George Bush's. More money for this, more money for that. We're going to beat these bad guys. We're going to beat those bad guys. And yet they have no plan on how to do it except to slather on more government and throw more money, troops, or whatever at the problem. The Kerry website, incidentally, uh, Chris points out, is www.johnkerry.com, surprisingly enough. I got pointed to the site after reading an article by Alana Mercer on LP presidential candidate Aaron Russo, and I'm curious to know if you will ever have him on the show for question and answer and or to state what he stands for. The current issue he's been speaking about is the return of the military draft, and I thought about that and thought, imagine, young men and women literally kidnapped from their homes, thrown into a vehicle, scared out of their wits, and hauled off to a camp where they'll be flayed and beaten into shape and then sent off to do someone else's dirty work. How much different is this from the African slave trade or the Nazi Holocaust? Just some thoughts from Chris in Ann Arbor, Michigan. As far as having Aaron Russo on the show, I will be speaking at the Libertarian National Convention Memorial Day weekend. That's uh, the end of this month, uh, month of May. And right now it's up in the air whether I will be emceeing the debate among the leading candidates for the presidential nomination of the Libertarian Party. And if I'm going to be the moderator of that debate, I do not want to have those gentlemen on my show because I want not to tip them off as to the kinds of questions I'm going to ask during that debate. I'm trying to get the LP to take a stand one way or another on this as to whether I'm going to do it, and if I'm not going to do it, then I definitely want to get them on my show, and we only have a few weeks left before that, so one way or another, that will be done. I will either have them on the show, or I will be interviewing them, in effect, on C-SPAN during the Libertarian Convention, because I'm sure that part of the convention will be covered on C-SPAN, and I'll get word to you through the show as to when you can see that. As far as the draft is concerned, you know my feelings about the draft. It's interesting uh, what... Chris said about why don't we just let the Iraqis determine this instead of trying to decide whether the U.S. should tell them what kind of government they have or the U.N. should tell them what kind of government they have. This whole thing reminds me so much of another situation. Uh, you know, Bush says the U.S. military will remain in Iraq after June 30th to oversee the elections in the new government. But how does this differ from the Soviet troops that were in Czechoslovakia and Poland and Hungary and Romania who oversaw the setting up of satellite governments in those countries and who saw to it that the people who were elected were friendly to the Soviet Union so that those countries remained satellites for many, many years? It seems to me that there is no difference between what the Soviets did then and what the U.S. is doing now. And let's take our final call of the evening now. It's from Paul in Houston, Texas. Good evening, Paul. Hi, how are you doing, Harry? Just fine, thank you. What's on your mind tonight? Uh, I just wanted to uh, let you know about another book. It's called War is a Racket by uh, Major General Smedley Butler. He was a, uh, one of the biggest heroes in the Marine Corps, which I'm a Marine and proud of it. But I was never uh, instructed about this book that he wrote after he got out of the service about how pretty much every major war we fought in is has been for the profit of uh, many private industries, and I just thought it was uh, interesting that you know in the Marine Corps boot camp they always teach us about Smedley Butler because he was such a hero. He won two Medal of, two, uh, Medal of Honors. Oh, they did. They did uh, tell you about Butler. Uh, yes, they they always told us about him because he's the only officer that won two Medals of Honor. But they never told us. I've never heard about this book through the Marine Corps. I understand. He, he was. I know it's very interesting because you read it and it reads just like a. Uh, a uh, libertarian candidate for president. Right. He was a big hero in both the Philippine War and in the uh, in the First World War, the Philippine War being the aftermath of the Spanish-American War when America liberated the Philippines and took three years to, to beat the stuff out of the Philippines so that they would appreciate being liberated. Sound familiar? Yes, oh, yeah. Yeah, it does sound familiar. But anyway, then Butler uh, got out of the Marine Corps, I guess around 1930, something like that, and that's in the 30s was when he wrote his book. And it is available on the Internet. It's not, a, it's not really a book. It's a booklet. It's a you know, like a 10-page dissertation on this, and the entire text of it is on the Internet. And what I will do as soon as the show is over, I will add that to the radio links page so that anyone listening can read War is a Racket by Smedley Butler and just go to the site and read it on the screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. But I'm glad you uh, reminded me of that. There are a lot of uh, very, very good books that uh, point out a lot of these things that we don't get in the textbooks that we read in elementary school, high school, and college, and certainly not in Marine Corps boot camp. Uh, yes, sir, I, can't, uh, I hope your book is as good as his, and I look forward to reading it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for calling. 
And every week at least somebody asks, what is it that we can do? And if believe me, if there were some magic bullet that I had at my disposal to tell you what to do so that we could make sure that by the end of this year we had outlawed war forever and that we had turned America into a libertarian society, I would not keep that from you. But like anything else in life, it's going to take hard work. But it is not impossible. I'm not telling you that we're going to succeed in a year, in five years, in 10 years, or in 20 years. All I'm telling you is that it is possible. Most people in America do not want to die. They do not want to go off to war. They do not want to send their children to war. They do not want America to be at war. They don't even want other people's children to be at war. Most people in America. And even the few who are mouthing the war slogans are doing so somewhat out of habit, simply because they're Republicans, or if it was in the 90s, because they were Democrats, and are not impossible to be shown the error of their ways. And it's also true, I believe, that most people in America think government is way too big and if somebody came along and presented a plan for getting from here to there, to getting to smaller government, they'd like to help out. We just have to keep plugging away and finding better and better ways to get this word out, finding, uh, let me back up, communicating with more and more people so that eventually we're communicating with the people who have the real influence, the real power, the wealth, the ability to do things that we can't do to get this country turned around. I'm not telling you we'll succeed. I'm simply telling you it is not impossible, even if it seems that way sometimes. So take hope, and in the meantime... Spend this week enjoying yourself, enjoying the fact that you are alive and that you are living in an America that is still a good place to live. This is Harry Brown. Thanks so much. Talk to you next week.